Hey everybody, how are you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on philosophy, logic, and George Boole, who lived from 1815 to 1864, it's just shy of 50, and is the inventor of Boolean algebra, which is particularly important. He didn't know it that uh, in, by those words, of course. He didn't call it my own private algebra or Idaho, but he was and is and remains one of the foremost important figures for formal logic. He would have found that quite amusing at the end of his life, again, given that he decently died in obscurity. But now his work is central to machines, telephone systems, before it became part of computers and then the Internet. So let's get into it. George Boole was an almost entirely self-taught logician who taught at Queen's College, Cork, Ireland. Which, much love to Cork, I've actually been there, it is not the first and foremost city nor college uh, out there, and yet he is centrally important to modern computer systems. He is best known for his Laws of Thought uh, from 1854. That year happens to be about the time Lewis Carroll was lecturing uh, children on a beach, much like the walrus and the, car and the carpenter, and was beginning to write Alice in Wonderland up through uh, 1864, during that decade in particular. And Lewis Carroll was studying Boole's Laws of Thought, as well as the work of uh, Aristotle, and I am going to argue in my talks on Lewis Carroll in Wonderland and the Looking Glass and the Snark, that Lewis Carroll is primarily playing with the ancient logic of Aristotle in debate in space and time with substances, and the ideal mathematical formal logic, uh, modern logic, formal logic of Boole and his laws of thought, and that he is portraying Boole at the Mad Tea Party as outside of time and thus ludicrous, but he is also showing a lot of problems with Aristotle mix up in space and time. Speaking of which, again, my uh, apologies for the construction noises, but they uh, always find time to do exactly what I don't need them to do exactly when I need to give my talks. So hopefully that dies down a bit. And again, I can just talk over and past it, uh, typically, usually, and that'll have to serve here. So the uh, bull died with little success uh, to his name. He again did not know what Boolean algebra was. He would have suspected, uh, given his work, but it was known as that by uh, later logicians and mathematicians who then supported and uh, along his work along with industry. So Boole died uh, without any fame the year the American Civil War ended and would have been astonished at how his name is so well known today as a fundamental founder of the information age. Boolean algebra, Boolean logic are fundamental to how logic was formalized is not necessarily the rules of thought, but was formalized in modern times as it became the language, functional equivalent of something like a language, if machines do talk, you know, for Turing or others, the language of telephone systems, electronic circuits, and computer languages, a la Python. Boole says logic is almost unchanged in his laws of thought. He begins saying logic is almost unchanged since Aristotle. Now this shows you, just like some Islamic uh, philosophers, logicians, and others following them in Europe, I still will give my talks on those and fit those in with logic here. But I'm going to concentrate on Boole and Carroll for this week. Boole says logic is almost unchanged since Aristotle. This shows you again, Aristotle is simply the go-to guy for a lot of logicians around the world, even though there is Chinese and Indian forms of logic and debate which are similar to Aristotle's and should be studied. And I have talks on all of that. That Boole presented the ancient Greeks uh, that Aristotle, uh, says Boole, presented the ancient Greeks with his partly technical and partly metaphysical organon. Boole mentions the Greeks Porphyry and Proclus. I actually studied uh, those uh, folks in grad school. Then the French Anselm, Abelard, and Descartes. And finally, the British Bacon and Locke as other remoter influences. Then the essential Aristotle. He says it, uh, Aristotle remains in form, and then he is trying to ma give mathematical, universal, abstract form to what he finds most solid in Aristotle in spite of the positive additions and understandings of each of these figures. Boole does not speak of Al-Farabi, Avicenna, nor of Eroes, the Persian and Spanish Muslims between the Greeks and the French. The opening sentence and paragraph of Boole's Laws of Thought shows us a different mind than Mill's. Please see Mill, 
I am going to say that uh, Aristotle, Mill, and Boole, and De Morgan give Carroll a rich horizon of material and immaterial formal logic, logic of this substantive world in space and time, the caterpillar and the Cheshire cat, and the world beyond, which uh, Lewis Carroll, as a believing Christian, did value beyond substantive material being. And I'm going to argue that consistently. Boole himself was likely of a similar mind. But in the opening uh, paragraph of Bull's Laws of Thought, he has a very different mind than Mill's. Please see my long talk on Mill and his logic and his mind state, which I do believe he shared decently with Carroll. And Carroll owned wor the work of Bull, Mill, and Aristotle, and uh, was debating De Morgan as well, and was uh, debating all this for himself as he composed Wonderland and his other works, fictional and non-fictional. The design, says Bull, of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of those operations of the mind, like Frege will later, and is instrumental in bringing uh, formal logic of Boole to analytic philosophy, Boole, like Frege, exactly like Frege will later, in the late 1800s, half a century later, says we need to assume, first and foremost, to know anything, there are fundamental fixed laws. He does not like Frege, prove there are fundamental laws. He says we need to assume there are fundamental laws in order to get anywhere entirely with solid certainty. Now, Aristotle also says that, but what would a cynic like Heraclitus or anyone else say? Of the Islamic world, of the Christian world, there are thinkers back and forth, as Hegel would claim, of all types here. Although Hegel is not as much into the Islamic world as I am, or their logics, that essentially... There are fundamental laws, we are going to reveal them, and he is going to try to find in Aristotle's most solid of forms, not the ten categories, because the sciences, uh, material and otherwise, have advanced decently beyond all of that, and Aristotle and Plato's understanding of the world and Plato's Timaeus, give or take the Pythagoreans, like Timaeus. That there are fundamental laws, as Newton says of nature, there are fundamental laws of logic thus, as and we are going to find the parts of Aristotle, he argues, that are most solid, and we're going to call those abstract universal laws. He very much argues this and says there is no arguing otherwise, which is very frege. He says, and I will quote again and begin again at length, the design of the following treatise is to investigate the fundamental laws of those operations of the mind by which reasoning is performed. There are laws of reasoning to give expression to them in the symbolic language of a calculus, to make them mathematical laws. Aristotle was very into mathematics, as were the Pythagoreans. He did not try to make it mathematical so simply, but that is what Boole, after Islamic algebra and equations, is doing. I do labor the point that ancient uh, thinkers such as Aristotle did not have algebraic equations and they talk things out more as word problems which is very important for Carroll and his own reasonings on logic and the wall problem but I will mention all that with Carroll so Boole says the calculus and upon this foundation to establish the science of logic similar words to Hegel oddly and construct its method to make that method itself the basis of a general method for the application of the mathematical doctrine of probabilities and finally to collect from these various elements from the various elements of truth brought it to view in the course of these inquiries some probable intimations concerning the nature and constitution of the human mind I'm interrupting this interview to conduct further inquiries. That's whether or not Boole or Aristotle ever got to Australia and saw the black swans there, or in the white crows, which contradict a bit, not verbally though, uh, by example and object. The full in substance. The various elements show us here that logic is not only has laws, but that the laws of logic are the laws underlying the human mind and reasoning. Now, I am a Wittgensteinian which means I don't believe this. I believe that there are regular situations that behave regularly, partly verbal, in behavior and life and, and reality, and that there need not be, with early Wittgenstein, as opposed to later Wittgenstein, laws of thought as opposed to behaviors and forms of life. But I'm not going to labor all that here. Instead, we will continue to lay out Boole, and I will lay out Wittgenstein after Carroll, which is where it will be quite appropriate. Boole assumes there are fundamental laws of the mind, but we cannot nor need show how nor why nor why we have the logical operations of reasoning that we do. Exactly like Frege, 
about 50 years, half a century later, who followed Boole specifically in formalizing mathematical logic further. Boole says that unfolding the secret laws of thought beyond perception and immediate understanding is something, quote, which does not stand in need of commendation to a rational mind, end quote. That means anybody rational would agree with him. There are laws of thought, we can just assume so. And, end quote, it is unnecessary, uh, I'm sorry, quote, not end quote, ha <laughs> ha, Quote, it is unnecessary to enter here into any argument to prove that the operations of the mind are in a certain real sense subject to laws and that a science of the mind is therefore possible. Now notice this in a very Newtonian way. If something is a science, it has to be composed not of paradigms or models, but laws that are set very much like mathematical plans of the Almighty uh, in creation itself and operative. So Boole, like Carroll, would probably decently believe in intelligent design, believes the world has Newtonian principles, and those were the way by which it was created by the Almighty, what have yous. And so, again, not to step for or against anyone's beliefs, um, and so he does say, as one might, that if someone's a rational person, one would know, as many logicians and European philosophers have so far argued, like Descartes, if you're a rationalist and a rational person, whether or not the rationalist, you would understand that there are laws, this world was created according to laws, and we all know that, therefore, human mind. Now, again, we need not prove one way or the other that, but that is certainly bull. I do simply mention here, it is not theistic or atheistic necessarily to say one way or the other that the world follows laws that human beings can comprehend conceptually. The book of Job is a clear example standing against the idea human beings can fully conceive or understand laws or plans of the Almighty, but that is, again, not for me to get into right here. I do mention with Kierkegaard and others, though, is that it is not simply dogmatic or skeptical to believe or disbelieve in religion or science. It takes all kinds. Please note that. So, like Kant, Boole says we can doubt there are laws of thought and we can't settle the dispute a priori by, a, a priori by appealing to the laws themselves. But rather we can see empirically, and this is again decently Kant, we just know and can assume there's laws of thought, but we can't show them entirely, but only show them somewhat. Uh, empirically in the world, uh, we can see our glasses through them at the things we see that the mind in our world follow these laws, we assume, veering back towards his fellow Britons and empiricism of Mill, in fact, which is still the rage even if it isn't taught at the colleges and universities quite yet. Boole stresses that logic, like all sciences, quote, must primarily rest upon observation, end quote. That is very interesting, again, for the more empirical or cynical or skeptical minded. And Aristotle's de omni et nullo, or all or none, what many call the principle of non-contradiction, that things if, cannot contradict themselves and be somewhat yes or no to certain in certain particular ways, at least, can be clearly seen as, a cert, as certain in particular examples, even if it can't be proved. Now, that is interesting, because some people would observe, if they're more skeptical, along with the Hegelese uh, laying out here, that if you're more skeptical, you would say the world clearly shows us contradictory cases where human judgment cannot bound it entirely up. In fact, that somewhat seems a little implicit in something of what Boole is saying. Well, I can't prove it, but we may as well assume it, and thus it is there. But he says we can see non-contradiction again and again. Now, Mill said we simply see it again and again. It isn't always true. It's often true, plenty non-contradiction. I can argue the man is a villain, he isn't a villain, and we can contradict, and one of us is right and the other is wrong. That does not mean even... In matters such as 2 plus 3 equals 5, always, in all practices. Mill would say we often see that the case. That does not mean non-contradiction is entirely true. Boole, however, much like Leibniz and Kant, says we know there are these laws. The most certain should be, and thus are the laws, but we cannot see them entirely, but we can see them over and over somewhat again and again, such that we can see certainly they are there, which is a very strange object for anyone more skeptical or a bit less Kantian than this. Boole argues that Aristotle's syllogisms are not the ultimate processes of logic, in his words, and, quote, they are founded upon and resolvable into ulterior and more simple processes which constitute the real elements of method in logic, end quote. Boole says we need a calculus of logic like Newton and Leibniz, those would be those he follows, created for mathematics and algebra. Language is often and possibly always an essential instrument of reasoning, he says. That's very true. 
Without language, in fact, again, I am inclined to say uh, mathematical reasoning is, in fact, a special sense of verbal reasoning with number words. I'm increasingly inclined to say, although it, it can overlap and not be contained within verbal reasoning. But language, Bull says, follows fixed laws, he says, such that we fix our interpretations of arbitrary signs. Wittgenstein would say a name is like a label, somewhat pasted. But Bull talks as if we simply fix things and then they mean what they mean and they do not change. Bull's example is X can stand for the class of men that includes all individual men and excludes all individuals and other things that aren't men. Nothing, which stands for an empty class of no individual things. And all being or universe, which stands for a class that includes all individual things. Bull says we can combine words and classes together, such that X stands for white things, Y for sheep, giving us XY, the conjunction of X and Y, as the class of white sheep, Wonderland, specifically, not Wonderland, but The Looking Glass. The sequel to Wonderland has a white sheep with knitting needles all confusing a bunch of things. I would claim category, space, time, everything all muddled in substance. And it's about in the place of the mad tea party in Wonderland, which I th would argue very much fall, uh, is mocking Bool. But he says similarly, XYZ, Bool says, can mean horned white sheep. The white sheep in Looking Glass is actually female and does not have horns. Bool's XY does not refer to all of X and Y together. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Just as our words white sheep do not refer to any sheep, nor to all white things. Rather, XY refers to the overlap of X and Y, the space shared by two intersecting circles in a simple Venn diagram. Bull says, and I found this very interesting, I think as people look over the white rabbit of Alice in Wonderland, which is very Aristotle, we are the rational animal, and yet you have an absurdly rational rabbit, it's like I'm late and then is all passionate and crazed, which would be our animal passionate part, that if you read Aristotle's logic work and then you read Bull's logic work carefully, there's a lot here that suggests white men, white animals, animals passionate and men. A lot of this, the white rabbit in the beginning of Wonderland that Alice follows into a world of logic and fantasy and argument and various emotive characters. Think here, I have to say, Bull says white men accept Asiatics except white Asiatics. And I have to say my the best case of this, I am uh, an anti-racist person who has studied a little bit of the history of racism and without getting all into that, white people, myself, I, so if somebody says, hey, it's a white guy, I'm like, you mean me? The Hindu Brahmins, the top caste in India, do refer to themselves occasionally in ways as white, as opposed to uh, black and dark of lower classes in India. <coughs> According to Hannaford and other scholars, you can find examples of the white face scholar in China and the Islamic world referring to white people and thus civilized scholarly indoor people. There's earlier parallels with Egypt and other things. But in India and China and the Islamic world, before Europe rose, you do find people referring to white people as sort of superiors but actually much more like Aristotle, they're pale white people who happen to have been indoors and they're superior because they're scholars, but they're not superior in all kinds of ways. But the Muslims increasingly did in ways, apparently the Persians uh, did sometimes refer to in the Middle Ages, as we sometimes call them, around 1100, 1200, refer to themselves as Persians as white. There is a play called The Whites versus the Blacks, which is actually a play mocking the difference of civilized Muslims versus African tribes in the Islamic world. And I would say nicely, although I haven't read the work, but I hear okay things, but that in that, it's sort of like a strange uh, Islamic comedy, you know, of sorts. And it is designed to say, oh, aren't we all human beings under the eyes of the Almighty? Isn't that amusing in spite of the cultures? And I'm not going to, you know, I have not read the work, so I won't handle it any differently than that. But it is in the wake of that that Europeans learn to call themselves white people. And originally, la raza of the Spanish, if you're a white, uh, blue-blooded Spaniard, which you could see the blue in your veins, did not mean all Spanish people like peasants, but just the raza, your race, was your family, your noble family. So actually, without saying anything, what, Boole uses the word white men. He means it the way we very much say it. 
And Europeans are learning in the 1800s and 1900s to refer to themselves as white people. They're not directly saying, oh, Muslims use the term, I'm going to use the term, but you can actually see the historical precedence. And actually, when Boole says white men accept white Asiatics, he probably means, I have to say, not the Persians, but the Hindu Brahmins. And that's because his family and the families of others, other Brits we've already discussed in logic are involved with India. And again, they don't say a word about how much Indian logic or Indian ethnic theories or castes or what have you is involved in their thought. They just simply do not mention it, just as he does not mention Muslims. But he says white men except white Asiatics is the example he uses for putting thought into equations. He uses white, which is one of the emotive temperaments of Aristotle. I am going to point out in Wonderland and Looking Glass, which I think is in there as a lesson of Aristotle, quite clearly. And Carol's not necessarily ourselves when it comes to referring to people as white and or colored and or otherwise in the 1800s. Yes, although I still like the guy plenty. Bull says white men except white Asiatics can be expressed as Z bracket X minus Y. That's his first and foremost example. With Z as white, X as men, and Y as Asiatics. Or be expressed as Z Y minus uh, Z X minus Z Y. The two expressions being equivalent or equal, such that Z X minus Y equals Z X minus Z Y. He's showing like De Morgan how to distribute brackets mathematically in a orders of operations way in order to try to, like De Morgan, give laws of thought that are quite mathematical and equational. That's what he is doing here. And white men, except white Indian Hindu Brahmins, I would claim, Asiatics. I think the best, uh, the best candidate is again Hindus here, unmentioned a bit but not entirely. And whether or not we want to call people white or not, he, he thinks that uh, he weirdly here, without saying more about it, does seem to think that Hindu Brahmins are superior white people, but he doesn't say superior and he doesn't say Hindus and he doesn't say Brahmins. So I'll leave that alone. Yes, after saying that. Bull speculates, and I do want people to keep that in mind when reading The White Rabbit of Lewis Carroll, unfortunately. Bull speculates, because Carroll thinks we're all human beings underneath the Almighty, and does think that we're a strange Aristotelian being. And all of that with Aristotle talking about white, pale, sickly people and we're the rational animal unlike the beasts who have our passions. Boole combined with Aristotle here very much gives you a, uh, a nice terrain for constructing a white rabbit of sorts. And these are the authors that Carroll was centrally concerned with. Bull speculates that if uh, if we were a species that split things into threes rather than twos, I do love this, with trichotomies rather than dichotomies, the laws of human thought would be completely different. I oftentimes tell my students if there was good, bad, and zerblat, you know, zerblat is one of my favorite uh, personal nonsense words that I made up. It's kind of like my last name, kind of like my grandmother's actually maiden last name, all screwed up together, actually, and I just sort of mangled it together as a word back in the day. If you didn't like religion, you didn't like science, don't worry. If you like humanity enough after that, you're going to love Zerblat when it comes along. It's really going to speak logically and rationally, unlike the previous systems, I got to tell you. You know, we're all waiting and hoping, I got to tell you. So, because we are creatures of dichotomy, all things are made up of the classes of men and not men together, as Bull says. Ladies, quote, a class whose members are at the same time men and not men does not exist. It is impossible for the same individual to be at the same time a man and not a man, end quote. Gender politics, of course, today aside, we're not going to talk about any of that right here. Much love and happiness. I come from the Bay again. I'm somewhat lefty-lefty, but again, that's not our issues here. So it follows with the Aristotelian example, animals are either rational or irrational, one or the other. Now, Lewis Carroll's conjunctive white rabbit is quite human and beast, and so, according to Aristotle, he impo he, uh, the white rabbit is himself impossibly, fantastically, a rational and irrational animal in the same individual, which is why he's passionate and freaking out that he's late, he's late, he's late, and checks a watch, which is exactly what gets Alice to follow him, that he's wearing a watch and is impossibly strangely human and planning things out. Fits Wittgenstein very well. I will not mention that here. Bull says we use the conjunctive words and and or permissively and strictly, equivalent to the combination of classes when permissive and the exclusive choice between classes when strict. This actually, myself, I was trying to find inclusive and exclusive or in the work of Carroll early on because that figures in Wittgenstein. I was mistaken to do so, I realize now, because Boole and De Morgan still haven't worked out at all anything like inclusive, exclusive or, although they're on the way to doing that for Frege and early Wittgenstein. 
We say X and Y and X or Y to mean what is both X and Y when permissive and mean when permissive and mean what is either X or Y, but not both. What is also called an exclusive or which Boole identifies with the mathematical plus Boole equates and an or and just says they function pretty much the same way, which is actually kind of hilarious because actually later logicians are like, no, they're completely different. And the work of Wittgenstein actually suggests they're different and the same and overlap. There are some situations in which and and or are equivalent, and Boole is right. There are other situations in which and and or are quite oppositional and contradictory and distinct. I'm not going to go over those here because it takes us outside the work of Boole. But I've already ranted in my first videos in my playlist about logic and uh, my talks and lectures about logic for the intro lectures for my logic classes. I labor at length for an hour or two or three explaining that and and or still hide interesting secrets in how we behave with them, I would say. And Boole here says he can equate the two, and later thinkers such as Wittgenstein would divide the two entirely and say they're strictly formally separate, but in fact both are strangely correct. Boole is correct that the two are equivalent sometimes, but he's incorrect because like the other logicians who would contradict him, such as Frege and Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein's early truth table logic, and and or can function in specifically opposite ways. But actually, if we're an elastic machine, as Wittgenstein says uh, suggestively in his later work, then it can be all of this in various situations and forms of life and space and time and uh, Pavlovian trained practices. But let us continue with Boole here and rather than get off into the Wittgensteinian weeds and forms and lives and life. It's quite an ecosystem, all of it. So Boole says... To conclude Boole, we are unable to interpret the square root of negative one. Now, this is a very important. There are many people nowadays who will say, oh, no, there, that's, that has an absolute mathematical answer. It didn't in the time of Boole and Carroll. The square root of negative one in the day of Boole and Carroll was impossible. It was not a solvable thing because people had not yet invented the solution, and the practices. And then those practices became extremely successful in mathematics and capable of being used in many ways, which is a very... Fu I have a decently functionalistic view, of course, uh, later Wittgensteinian, of mathematics. So actually, in the time of Bull and Carroll, somebody... I definitely have students who would say, no, it really had an answer. They didn't know it yet. Technically, math was not practiced in the time of Bull and Carroll such that square root of negative one had an answer. Again... I won't explain that or pretend I know the answer to it or they did or anyone does right now. But today there is an answer of that in other practices. Which is again with the parallel bars and I don't, I can't stick that landing. Boole says we are unable to interpret the square root of negative one. It's impossible for him yet. And this illustrates that he accepts neither negative nor imaginary numbers as mathematical. You can see hints in Carroll's work and in, uh, I would say, in Wonderland and the Looking Glass. There are hints that imaginary uh, numbers are just imaginary. In fact, the fictional characters of Carroll are not simply mocking uh, imaginary numbers. But imaginary numbers and that they had to exist is at the time of Lewis Carroll doing Wonderland and Looking Glass, reading Boole and Aristotle and trying to figure out what he can save of Aristotle and negotiate versus Boole's work. So, Boole, then, it should be given to Boole that he uh, creates a system of pro possibility and probability, which is quite famous as well. With zero is impossible and false, one is certain and true, and values between zero and one is possible. We had De Morgan last. He showed, as I said, at the same time, that if you speak things out more like a logic problem, uh, a word problem, sorry, a logic problem could be a word logic problem, such that if you talk it out, you can see that some of this and some of that can, and most of this and most of that can mean some of those at the bar at the Titanic, as I gave the poor example last time. Those in Cork, uh, strangely enough, I was thinking of the Titanic in Cork, where Bull is from, famously uh, sent out salvage missions to help and save those from the Titanic, and is known as uh, for such. So, uh, I don't recall the date of that, actually. I think it was after Bull, uh, by several decades, I believe. I'd have to check it out, uh, sadly. So, with possibilities, Bull says impossible is zero, one is certain, and there are values ranging between the two, such that 0.5, half, is the possibility of a coin turning up heads or tails. This, again, still remains foundational too much today. Bull concludes his work, saying, quote, 
Always and everywhere, the manifestation of order affords a presumption, not measurable indeed, but real, of the fulfillment of an end or purpose, and the existence of a ground of orderly causation. End quote. Insofar as men try to trace everything back to a primordial unity in mind, Boole says, quote, Herein too many be felt the powerless of mere logic. Like Carroll, he believes in the beyond. The insufficiency of the profoundest knowledge of the laws of the understanding to resolve those problems which lie nearer our hearts as progressive years strip away from our life the illusions of its golden dawn. All in a golden afternoon. Bull was reading this work and he was coming up with Wonderland. And in Wonderland, the first fiction, a famous of Carol, he has Alice attend a mad tea party that's quite Boolean outside of space and time. They've angered time, so time isn't dealing with them. I claim it is the caterpillar. We don't see the caterpillar angered by the tea party, although the caterpillar is quite uh, snippy. And if we are at the tea party for long enough with Alice, we notice this mere moves formal of logic do not satisfy us. And as we get into our later years, possibly alongside Carol's understanding, we see that what lies beyond mere human logic, why then does Boole claim it? we know it must have laws we can comprehend mathematically thus? If he ends with this note, which is much like the opening of Wonderland, all in the golden afternoon of the children who, pres who and Alice preserves her childlike wonder through all the forms and the characters in the end, in spite of it all. Here we have something that sounds very, very Carol, and I end with, and Boole ends with it too, in his work on logic that Carol owned, that at the end of all this, we understand, not only in life, but in the end of our studies of logic and at the end of reading Bull's work, we find that logic is a human tool and that we're powerless to understand what truly gives it force and the source of its laws beyond. That itself seems like the perfect point to conclude with Bull, and then begin with Carol. So, much love, much happiness. I am going to begin on my talks about Carol's life and then with my presentations and videos for the Carol Society of North America as well as for everyone on the Aristotle, Boole, De Morgan, and others I find in the famous fantasies of Carol. Wonderland, The Looking Glass, and The Hunting of the Snark. All which I do argue fundamentally have to do with the order and uh, number of Aristotle's logical categories. Much love, much happiness, much forms of life, and much logic with those you even want to talk to anymore. Happiness, and I will see you, as always, if I do indeed ever see you.